So uh, we all know Dr. Pramod Bende, sir. Uh, he is very esteemed retina faculty, and he is associated with Sankar Nizarla since very long time. And uh, we are eagerly waiting for his talk. And uh, let's start. The okay, fine. So, okay, good evening uh, once again. And thank you very much for having me here. And thanks, uh, Atul, uh, for putting all, and of course, your entire team putting hard, uh, like a lot of hard work to coordinate all the activities. So as Atul suggested, I'm trying to be just the audience. He said, preferably young uh, VR surgeon, just beginning their practice or outgoing fellows. So uh, if some seniors are there, obviously they can add on it and bear with me if I'm, I'll be too basic in it, uh, to start with. I think you will have to just tolerate me that in that sense. So let us start with uh, diabetic retinopathy. Just uh, basically indications I divide into three groups. One is media opacity, which includes non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage or premacular hemorrhage or premacular fibrosis, or you have astrohalysis where uh, may not be tractional detachment or sometime because of asteroid, you cannot see the retina properly. Though fluorescent angiography, as you see here, show proliferative changes, but obviously you can't do laser and Probably this is again one of the indications for vitrectomy in this group. So uh, vitreous hemorrhage when you're dealing with, obviously classical indications would be young diabetics, one-eyed patients, no previous laser done, more extensive or vascular fibrovascular fiber proliferations. You have ultrasound shows underlying traction or combined detachment or have associated anti-segment uh, new vascularization. But situations where you have a already well laser eye, there's a history or you're following the patient and you know the patient is having a very well laser done, complete PVD, or sometimes poor systemic status, you don't have choice because you're not getting fitness or uh, like a, his, uh, the general condition is absolutely unstable, you don't have choice but to wait. So with the current scenario, with a new instrument and techniques and our we are more and more confident probably we are to do vitrectomy as much earlier now than what previously we used to do. So second group would be a tractional component where you have a typically tractional lateral detachment and combined tractional plus regmatogenous lateral detachment. These are the like a major bulk, I would say, as far as indication of vitrectomy in a diabetic eyes are concerned. And other indication could be macular edema, with having a obviously traction uh, and uh, another group is associated macular distortion. So coming to detachment in a PDRIs, there are two, as I said, tractional or combined detachment, and both can have associated with fibrovascular proliferation of various severity. And generally these eyes need extensive and complex VR surgery. Now, a word about vitreo macular in rather rather vitreo retinal association or interface typically if you see what happened because of this vitreo, vitreo retinal adhesions you have a different patterns of tractional detachments they occur if you have a single attachment if you see my pointer corresponding ultrasound also have showing here so you can have a just single point attachment at the disc and you have an associated posterior highlight incomplete PVD, what we all of us talk about. There is retinized attached otherwise. The second group can be have focal or point attachment, and those can be one or multiple, typically giving a multiple, like a, a hammock-like appearance and having a valleys in between. And ultrasound, as you see, also can see posterior highlight showing a multiple elevations of the retina. The third group where you have broad attachments, and this can be one single broad attachment, or you can have a multiple, like a, a folds of the retina underneath, giving something like called as tabletop tractional detachment. Basically, it's a broad attachment with a broad flat attachments. Now, it can involve the center of the retina, rather posterior pole, I would say, rather than center, or peripheral retina. So ultrasonography definitely useful uh, to assess this configuration where you are not, uh, where, where there is no view of the fundus. 
just basically it need to understand because you plan your surgery accordingly coming to tractional detachment usually typically when you look at the fundus and when there is a view it is like a tented up immobile and concave retina as compared to regmatinous rd which is generally bullous mobile and convex you always have associated fibrovascular proliferation it can be either fibrous or can be more vascular depending on case to case and that will come combination that will come when you deal with the regmatinous component later on so now tia this tractional detachment or tid it can be depending on whether macula involvement you call it as either extramacular where macula is not involved you can have extramacular but it is approaching the macula what we call as tid threatening the macula or macula can directly be involved why it's important to understand is when you look at a natural course of this trd if its macula is not involved and when you look at the progression towards the macula only 30% progress to macula involvement in one year to 23 by end of 3 years what does that indicate is trd remains stable over a prolonged period of time and patient with extra macular trd can be safely observed provided they are willing to come for regular checkup there is no hurry in those situations however so indications for vitrectomy when you are dealing with trd is either when macula is already involved or your extra macular detachment trd with a documented progression towards the macula or you have a tractional detachment which is covered or, he or hidden by overlying vitreous hemorrhage and you are really not sure about macular status uh, probably better it is safer to err on a uh, vitrectomy side going at it with surgery rather than observing these type of eyes coming to the combined detachment so looking at a mechanism generally what happen is we have either fibrosis after proliferation or posterior hyoid leading to subsequent contraction or sometime you have heavy laser which again cause a contraction of the retina or nearby fibrous tissue leading inducing the traction and generally create a break in a retina which is tented up now where here break is probably sometime at the point of the laser burn or when you are dealing with a proliferation generally break is you break generally you see at the base of the proliferation the the commonest configuration would be incomplete pvd with a small single overbreak as i said near the proliferation or uh, area of iv traction or it can have a small flap tear because of anteroposterior traction as you see the uh, animation this picture here okay you can have sometimes slit or round break without any flap of upper coulomb basically is because of tangential traction along the blood vessel and these breaks are just next to adjacent to the blood vessel so but sometimes you can't see uh, where look you can't identify a break pre operatively because of probably overlying thick fibrous proliferation or have retinal fold or associated with hemorrhage or other opacities and probably this configuration gives you a clue that probably you are dealing with a uh, reg, uh, regmatinous component in tractional detachment and will be probably these are the indications for early surgery so typically retina is mobile in a combined rd and once a break is develop uh, occur generally these eyes like a regmatinous component with regmatinous rd along with a tractional component can rapidly progress towards the periphery unless it is demarcated by laser or other scar tissues as against trds are generally limited to the localized area of fibrosis and traction now come with crd generally occurs secondary to trd so usually retina is generally a long standing detachment and retina is usually thin and atrophic and obviously sometime you need to differentiate it from tractional sciasis as well this is a typical picture what you see this localized combined rd had a central hole there but it was not extending beyond because the laser mark is by holding it demarcating cuz acting as a barrage so it's a localized uh, combined detachment this another picture i already showed where you have a trd and when compare to this uh, third picture where you have a tractional sciasis so you have a inner because of traction retina splits here what you call as tractional sciasis and this breaks in our inner layer of the retina and actually there is no uh, 
break my thickness component as such. There is no full thickness break. But however, because there is a macular attraction, these I also subsequently needed uh, surgery. The last group, which we generally deals with post vitrectomy group, probably we will not cover this group in our today's talk. Sometime like a post vitrectomy complicated cataract or a, a fulminant fibrovascular fellowship or impression. You have hemolytic glaucoma because of recurrent vitreous hemorrhage, or you can have a plaque or hard exudates at the macula. That's a separate group. Again, a separate, again it's out of scope. And the last one where you, have, you can have anterohyaloid fibrovascular proliferation. This is a typical uh, UBM picture. And these eyes probably, again, need re or with anti and additional, uh, uh, if VV is clear, you can add on additional laser or ARC. You can do these eyes. So coming to the goal of the surgery, basically to remove the media opacities, to relieve all the tractions, both anterior, posterior, and tangential, and to stabilize diabetic neovascular process by removing the vitreous scaffolds, remove the surface fibrovascular proliferation, and laser to ischemic retina. So preoperative evaluation is very, very important. Look for a row, as is well, typical any eye examination, you need to record vision. Look for a rubiosis or angle neovascularization in anterior segment when you're examining. Look for a pupil dilatation and lens status because that is going to help you for your visualization of retina during surgery. And fundus evaluation to look for media clarity, severity of fibrovascular proliferation, extent and configuration of detachment, status of the disc macula because that again will help us to discuss a prognosis with the patient before taking them for surgery. And of course, uh, status of the fellow eye, because sometimes depending on status of fellow eye, you decide whether to take some particularly bad cases, whether to take them for surgery or not. Uh, it's kind of sometimes, uh, if other eyes already uh, lost, sometimes even if it's a difficult, say, like a, even if a very aggressive disease, you still want to give a chance. But if other eye is good, probably those are the eyes probably you may give a leave option with the patient to decide and other leaving that eye alone. And of course, general medical condition in most of these diabetics is extremely important. Most of them are having a nephropathy, cardiac issues, uh, CNS issues. So unless you have a clearance for your physician, a diabetologist, probably sometimes difficult to take these cases for surgery. And it's important to discuss prognosis with the patients and the relatives, because we all know diabetic is, is you can just control and diabetic retinopathy is in generally progressive condition. And even though surgery goes well, recurrence, vitreous hemorrhage, re-proliferation, neovascular glaucoma, all those things still patient can land up in a later on. So it's extremely important to discuss with the patient about future natural course of the disease as well as uh, possible need of intervention at a later stage. Also, if there is no view of the fundus, Ultrasonography is extremely helpful part to assess the status of the retina. Um, again, it's uh, whether it's attached or having a de uh, retinal detachment, and if it detachment, again, location and configurations. We'll come to that a little bit later as we discuss surgical steps. Uh, status of the posterior hyaloid, associated vitreous membrane and vitreous kyesis. And UBM may help in sometimes situations where you have a recurrent vitreous hemorrhage, to identify anterohyaloid proliferation or proliferation at the sclerotomy site, as you see the corresponding picture here, UBM scan showing proliferation at the sclerotomy site. So basic steps include, obviously you need to look at good pupillary dilatation, anesthesia, generally most of the cases now we can manage under local anesthesia. There are a few reports even people have tried under topical anesthesia as well, but considering uh, we have, and young age, sometimes general anesthesia can be given, but like a, like, like a most, most of the cases are being done under local anesthesia. So these are just list of uh, uh, steps, what we go through. We'll go one by one as we tie uh, with the subsequent slides. So now surgical planning is strongly influenced by the extent of posterior vitreous separation. PVD is, is paramount important for us. And cases where there's no posterior highlight separation, those are the most difficult cases to deal with. So look for extent of PVD because that will give a cleavage of plane. And as also along with the location and a type of VR attachments and general medical condition as we already discussed. So basically it comes now where to start surgery. So 
this is a typical vitreous hemorrhage case. And when you initiate the uh, surgery and you do not know, you can't see where the retina is, probably always makes sense to initiate surgery right at the sclerotomy site and clear the vitreous near sclerotomy site as you see cutter is moving forward and clear this area rather than moving right in a mid vitreous cavity because you, you, we are a little bit blinded initially. And once this sclerotomy area is clear, start moving on either side slowly, stay at a periphery and as media start clearing, then you proceed further. Now, sometimes, and once you clear the peripheral area, then come into anterior mid vitreous cavity. This is another case with the vitreous hemorrhage. So, and then start slowly, slowly anterior vitreous clearing, and then going to the mid vitreous cavity. So, always keep eye, go layer by layer. Okay? Uh, don't dig into our jump into the mid vitreous cavity to start with starting the vitrectomy. Now, another practical difficulty is, as you see here, uh, sometimes this is having IOL, so things were a little bit easier, but sometimes you have a clear lens and you have vitreous in a, a vit hemorrhage, you know, anterior vitreous uh, cavity or even uh, retrolental blood clot. Sometimes things can be difficult and unless you clear that, you may not be able to proceed with your vitrectomy because visualization definitely going to be significantly compromised. So you need to clear this vitreous. Uh, so what you can do is uh, basically once the peripheral vitreous partly are clear, you start, you come behind the lens rather than uh, directly cutting. This, this is a little bit fast forward video, but what basically principle here is you activate suction, come behind the lens first, activate the suction. And once you catch the vitreous into the port, what you see is something dimple at your port. You drag the port gently back and activate the cutter. So when you put, pull the cutter back and activate the cutter, that part of chunk of vitreous, you are going to chew it. Remaining vitreous is going to jump back towards the lens again. So you keep on doing repeatedly, just suck it gently, pull back and then activate cutter. Again, suck it, pull back and activate the cutter and slowly, again, I'm just playing this one, probably able to, I didn't even appreciate it better now, as you cut here, see this part and slowly it start retracting on either side. As you cut here, and once trans vitreal traction is relieved, the fibers retract on either side, and thereby you get a reasonably clear uh, retrolental space to move forward. And once you have done that, what you start opening the posterior hyaloid once anterior mid vitrectomy is done. So again, now where to open posterior hyaloid is again that helps you. But typically, look at your ultrasonography, and if you have done ultrasonography, preferably previous day and you yourself do with ultrasonography, then you know exactly where the more sp space between posterior hyaloid and the retina. And then accordingly, that is a quadrant you choose. If I'm not sure about probably superonasal quadrant would be a little bit safer, even if you hydrogenic complication you create, but, before, but that's the way you start it and then go all around truncating anterior hyaloid that will help you to get a uh, clear entire anterior, uh, posterior hyaloid, sorry, clear posterior hyaloid and that's why you are getting approaching approach to your retina. Now, cases where you have a difficult posterior hyaloid is not separated. These are typical cases where sometimes you are lucky enough. Here, uh, just with, with the suction, I could induce POD. This patient did not have much proliferation, and just I could uh, use a suction to lift it up. This is another case has a vitreous macular traction here, and use a tricot. This is what routinely all of you do. Nothing much different here, but gentle suction up and at the same time, a little bit tangential to the retina to lift, get this vis ring, and then you clear. These are a little bit simpler cases. And once it is separate, post hyaloid is once it's separated, things become much easier for any VR surgery, and you remove the rest of the vitreous accordingly, and then treat retina, laser, or whatever you have to do later on. Now, this is a little bit difficult scenario. You are with a prolifious holding of the retina here. So sometimes it's difficult. So you trim all around and then uh, take it forward. Now, this was other case where the posterior laser was holding the posterior hyaloid back. There was no separation. So once you separate around the disc and around the prolif, and gently you start lifting the posterior hyaloid up uh, and keep on going towards periphery. Now, the difference here between what diabetic, diabetic cases and a degmatinous RD or suppose macular hole or ERM you are doing, there you induce entire PVD and then you keep on chewing it up. Here, you can't do that. As you see here, you gently lift one area, 
then chew it up. Again, uh, have a, a activate the suction, go a little bit further. So you can keep on elevating and keep on cutting it, keep on elevating, keep on cutting it. Basically, the purpose is you don't want to have transmitted traction creating hydrogenic break somewhere else. And that's why whatever area gently you're lifting it, and certain area where you have prolif is firmly other and probably you have to go around the prolifs initially, trim around the uh, where leaving the frill of the vitreous around the prolif and get a, the rest of the vit posterior hyoid and vitreous out. Now this is sorry, this is okay, next one. So now these are a little bit more difficult cases. Here again, subhyoid him, but relatively you are safe here because a lot of blood clot is cushioning between the posterior hyoid and the uh, retina. So what I did here is use MVR blade to slice and create an opening in a posterior hyoid. And once that is done, of course, again, I was a little bit lucky here because when I created this and tried to lift, entire thing came up, but it may not happen that in every case. So once you create this opening, you can use your cutter to start trimming the posterior highlight and simultaneously suck this preretinal blood or sub highlight blood. And then the rest of the vitreous slowly you can start lifting up. So it's it just you look at here i was just trying to slice through and then when i pulling this whole this thing separated probably i was lucky at that time without creating any hydrogenic problem and this came out and then you treat uh, just remove this entire vitreous and blood and followed by a laser as against when you deal with this eye now whole thing is firmly adherent so there was no cleavage so i had to create opening with the mvr here and gently keep on rotating here. These are the firm attachments here. Other, you see flat proliferations here. So you have to go around that and keep on lifting gently. Sometime, I mean, this is so rarely you need, but you may have to use a scissor to circumvent, cut around these attachments when you want to lift it. But once you lift over the disc, things are become a little bit safer right? or easier. Okay. As you see here, but you see transmitted tug here in the periphery. So you have to keep eye here where even though you are pulling here and sometime otherwise you can create a break at the periphery. So extremely careful. And if necessary, whatever area you are lifted up, you trim that area first and then gently go clock hour by clock hour. Now, the most difficult part here is what you are dealing with. When you have associated combined detachment as well, when underlying retina is mobile, there is no counter traction. And that is a situation then you have a difficulty dealing with. As you see here, when you try to lift the posterior highlight, entire retina start lifting out because so that situation again probably you lift use activate the suction and sometime light pipe you use to hold the retina back to get your added uh, counter traction so gentle lift as you trim it separate uh, separate it little bit then trim this area activate your cutter as you see here now here setting was obviously shaving mode uh, otherwise, the chances of retina jumping into port is very, very high. You have to be extremely careful, low suction, shaving mode. Again here, activate suction, lift gently. And again, trim that area. So basically, why it is important, otherwise you cut, here, pull here, and this track, vitreous, which is adherent here, can tear the retina this way. So keep on like a lifting and cutting, lifting and cutting, so that you don't land up in a transmitted traction. So that is as far as PVD is concerned. Coming to the membrane surgery is one of the most challenging but important step. The reason being retina is extremely thin and ischemic in most of the time. Prolif can be of variable severity. And generally, most quite some time, you land up having a, a bleeding probably. And this bleeding subsequently can lead to decreased visualization and uh, subsequent uh, like a steps of the surgery can sometimes become difficult because when this blood goes under the membrane and sandwich between retina and the proliferation. So particularly these eyes, when you're having fluorid polyp, incidence of hydrogenic tunnel break is as high as high, almost 45%. So now just few, typically though with the new MIVS, uh, we are not talking about this. So basically as a beginner, we all know basic surgical technique is what we do as a segmentation or delamination. So what is meant by segmentation? Basically, scissor is at the right angle. If you see here, once the vitrectomy is done, now scissor is right angle 
to the proliferation and to the retina and you cut across the prolif you know, into small, small segments. So that is why you call it as segmentation. So these are small, small segments, multiple segments you create, small islands you have created. So what happened with this small island? Then it's easier for you to the, each individual island, you can just chew it up one by one. Technically, it's uh, safer and much easier, not safer, rather I would say easier way technically. But the difficulty here is when you cut across the membrane, you are cutting across the blood vessels also. And then there is a high risk of bleeding during dealing with this. And also there's a tendency to leaving some stumps behind and these stumps can be a source for future reproliferation and recurrent bleeding as well. As against when you have a delamination you are dealing with. So Vedicary delamination where scissors are parallel to the retinal plane. So you go, scissor blades are flat, parallel, and go in between the retina and a membrane. So you gently lift the membrane where you see identify epicenters and trim one by one. Once you trim one, then the roll further, lift the membrane gently, again go, cut another epicenter. Again lift it, <coughs> roll it, <coughs> see the epicenters and cut again. So it's a little bit like a slow, longer process, but advantage is you are not cutting across the blood vessel, so bleeding will be less. And you get, a, in fact, more complete membrane removal so once you are done, probably chances of recurrent proliferation or re-bleeding are less, but yes, drawback is technically, it is much more difficult than the segmentation. So basically by coming to biomanual surgery, what we do here is generally multifunctional functional instruments or basically more illumination sources like illumination and your infusion combined together or your instrument themselves can be multifunctional now. So uh, so what happened with that? Because uh, more and more complicated surgery can be done much easily now, which otherwise would have been difficult older days. A <laughs> typical, uh, you, you use quite a bimanual surgery if you are dealing with a chandelier or twin light source, that's more easily and commonly available now. So, and where to put your like an extra sclerotomy, basically either you can put 12 o'clock area as you saw here, or maybe somewhere like a inferior temporal. That's inferior temporal is a commonest location because you have extra space, but you can use, you can put it anywhere, wherever you want. Uh, basically the logic is initially you, you look at the condition, you look at the configuration of the detachment and proliferation, and see where you would like to initiate your dissection because uh, if you have a, and in that meridian, probably I would use a, my chandelier because if you put in opposite quadrant, what happen, you start lifting the membrane and if chandelier is an opposite quadrant, that membrane itself casts shadow on your surgical field and probably visibility can get compromised. So you, you decide where you would like to initiate the membrane dissection and accordingly you choose your meridian of putting your uh, chandelier. So coming really where you would like to initiate the dissection. Again, it depends on configuration of the detachment, surgeon's experience and availability of instruments. Though we talk about whether we should go periphery to center or center to periphery, each case is different and you have to choose accordingly. Now, before initiate that dissection, what you need to understand is concept of what is vitreoscisis here. So, uh, sorry, let me go back. So what you have here, if you see the this uh, picture animation, so in posterior highlight separates, it's basically split. So one layer will be separate and other layer run along the retina. Uh, and that sometimes can be mistaken as a basically, and actually it is can easily be missed. And you can see on ultrasound also these white arrows, what you are seeing a central part is firmly other end, posterior highlight other end to the membrane. But, and that is a proliferation also. And when vitreous separates, you can see there's a distinct two layers of the vitreous and that outer layer probably, other, sorry, inner layer in the vitreous cavity, you can easily be removed. But what happens is you miss, if you miss this in the outer layer, and then probably you will be at a wrong plane uh, uh, in a dissection and then surgery can become a little bit messy, can lead to complication. To elaborate it much, if you see here now, this is not the age of the uh, uh, dissection plane rather, but when you 
move this, you can see some glistening area here around. So we do look at the go towards this is the edge glistening area and see this membrane is spreading far beyond than actually your visible membrane. It's almost up to here. That is what is guys is. So you need to identify it. And once you separate it, as you start separating, you've got to get a plane. It moves, as you see here, quite far further. So specifically, you have to look for, and as you start separating it, and you see membrane, there's a distinct gap now here. Planes are, rather than having a smooth membrane running over the retina, you can see this clear cut here. Now this is fully separated, cleavage, clear cleavage, and then you get this membrane. Now technically surgery become extremely easy after that. But crucial part is identifying uh, the vitreous crisis or second membrane, what you call it as, and right plane for the resection. This is again a two cases, two different things. So this is not the age of the membrane. Uh, this is not the clear uh, plane, but what you are having, you see there's a thin flimsy membrane going here. Similarly, this other case, as you see, this is not a cleavage here, but it goes far beyond and this, unless you separate this, once you get this, then only you will be able to, you are in the right plane to dissect the fibrous tissue properly and safely. So this is just to say, and this is typically what you see, periphery to center dissection. You, after truncation of the cone, you start separating the vitreous uh, membrane, start towards periphery and approach going towards the disc. That is periphery to center. And most of the time, this is what you prefer approach. Once you have finished your truncation, and uh, you go ahead with that. But certain situation, and you see here, there is no PVD, large prolif. It itself is extending quite far beyond. And here, this vitreous also is attached. So you cannot have truncation of the cone here. There is no cleavage plane. And this type of situation, probably you need to start at the center gently create a cleavage, and this obviously bimanual dissection is extremely helpful here, lifting the membrane with a forceps, get the cleavage plane, and try to uh, 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 separate those epicenters, and layer by slowly, slowly keep on extending towards the periphery. Well, so coming to MIVS per se, uh, you have a, now the advantage port optimization, what does that mean is port is closer to the end of the cutter. And that's why it allows surgeon to work closer to the retina and we will get a closer or better vitreous shaving. So this, because of this port, small port fits and between the retina and membrane clearly, so it can be used either as, as you see, like a spatula or it use a suction to work as a forceps and then activate the cutter to use it as a sort of scissor. So all the more maneuvers you can do with uh, same one single instrument in most of the cases. So this is again, so what you're again showing is comparison between a scissor and cutter. So typically, as you see here, I'm using here exactly same the way epicenter you get, uh, cut one by one, identifying them and similarly with the cutter also exactly similar way. Now here, uh, typically what you do is even though it's a high speed cutter, you need not go 1,000, like a 15,000 or 20,000 or 10,000 or 7,500, don't have to worry about. In fact, this is when you want to use at a scissor, you reduce your cut rate significantly. And literally you want to use as a, even sometime 100 or 200, I use cut rate with shaving mode. So literally this cutter can be used as a, each individual uh, attachment you can snip off like you are using scissor. And that's what's comparative video I wanted to show here. So uh, functioning exactly same way. However, so when you are dealing with a combined detachment, retina is mobile, when there is no traction, I would still prefer scissor is a better because having a much better control, as you see here, uh, because suction cutter always works with a initially acts as a suck and cut, suck and cut, because unless tissue will get sucked into the, the cutter, it will not cut. And that's why probably uh, this type of dissection, I would say scissor is definitely much better. The added advantage of scissor is when scissor cuts through these epicenters, it also has a crushing action. And that way, sometimes it itself acts as a um, hemostasis as well as against when a cutter is having a sharp, slice like a guillotine, so probably chances of bleeding is much, much more with a, when you're using a cutter. Now, MIVS, a lot of techniques uh, have been described, something like under ERM approach, 
uh, where you port is facing up towards the membrane and away from the retina. So you avoid hydrogenic break or you have conformal delamination where you as a side approach, as you see here. So feeding the membrane directly into the port while cutting. So minimize the risk of uh, uh, creating hydrogenic complications or you can have something called as fold back technique. So your cutter remains over the membrane and allow the membrane with the suction and then cutting subsequently, membrane rolls over in, in, in the port. So you have a cushion of another layer of the membrane and thereby you avoid hydrogenic complication, but it's difficult to use this manual, particularly when you are dealing with a, again, mobile retina. It works well when you're having a tractional detachment, uh, retina is not detached at all. However, when you look at overall technique, particularly when you finish surgery and look at your own video, you realize most of the time, most of us, what we do is not one technique, it's a combination of everything, roll back, it's a, using a separation or under uh, uh, like a delamination or segmentation. Now this was segmentation, then sometime in between delamination. Basically the, the technique what you use is, is a hybrid or combination of all described technique, not really one technique. Now, when you deal with the combined detachment, basically this once the dissection is over and you do a clean job, because basically when you're doing a, a CR combined detachment, when you have regimatous component, all the membrane you need to remove, you cannot leave anything back. And once membranes are removed, now you are left with a regimatous RD and you have now all principle of regimatous RD come into play. Uh, once you relieve the traction, then you do fluid air exchange, subletral fluid. If peripheral traction is persistent, probably you add on bell buckle or segmental buckle or broad buckle. If still that you feel not enough, then retinotomy, retinectomy, followed by once retina is flattened down, laser or cryo. And along with, of course, PR, pan retinal laser photocoagulation, you are going to do if it is not done earlier. And along with, you need an internal tamponade. Not necessarily that you need to use silicon in all cases. Once you deal with the regmatinous RD, the similar way because just diabetes and I am using silicon oil, not really necessary. If retina settled down well, you have done good uh, um, traction relief. Our traction is supported by, and if brakes are superior, comfortably you can use gas, right? Really not necessary to use silicon oil. Now, bleeding is an integral part of all these diabetic cases. It is it occurs because of cutting new vascular fronts or cutting through retinal blood vessels, and it can be a variable severity. So if it's very mild dose, is stops on its own, or you need to some active maneuver like increase intraocular pressure or doing fluid air exchange, or sometimes you directly inject viscoelastic over it. Generally, we don't want to use viscoelastic most of the time, or sometimes you apply manual pressure, gently hold your cutter over it for a while and it stops. What is more important is uh, don't ignore even if you smallest possible breeder as well. Take it seriously, stop, that bleeder first. So particularly if smaller, milder who's are, who's are there, you just stop the, uh, your surgery, stop suction, cutting, and you hold on for a while, that itself stops because, uh, but if you continue cutting sometime because of fluid currents and that blood get washed up and not allowing to clot, sometime it keep on oozing. So if bleeders are sick, if bleeder is larger enough, probably then you will have to use a diathermy to uh, stop the bleeders. But what is most important is avoid, avoid farming larger clot because then subsequently it becomes difficult to remove those because this fresh blood sticks to retina quite nicely. And when removing the clot lateral, sometimes that is the time probably you will end up creating hydrogenic break and not really while doing membrane peeling. And also when your bleeding is small bitters creating problem for you and even increasing IOP, you feel uh, it's not stopping, look at the monitor, check. Sometimes it is because of high systemic blood pressure. And so, and unless you bring down that blood pressure, probably these bleeders will not stop. So if just ensure monitoring and uh, systemic BP also is equally important while handling these cases. So when you want to remove the clot, obviously if it's a, you can agitate it with your back flush needle or extrusion needle or your proportional diffrex you can use on a, uh, now newer vitrectomy machines, okay. Generally, you start at the periphery where retina is attached or not mobile rather, I would say, and gently holding the edge of blood clot, try to roll it up and then shave it up. 
but few areas where fresh uh, attachments we have a particularly you know, cut those epicenters or stumps of the blood vessels if they are sitting there and uh, stuck there do not attempt to remove those because if you try to remove it will start bleeding again or sometimes that can create hydrogenic complication as well basically again hydrogenic breaks as i said sometimes even reported as high as 45 percent so the small few tricks you can minimize the incident i won't say you can avoid but you can minimize so before start starting your membrane dissection ensure you do a good debulking of peripheral vitreous your movement should be controlled use preferably moderately high magnification which you are compatible with so you have excellent visibility and have a good depth perception and so you are at a right plane and again high iop again surge will be more so probably avoid uh, i mean basically intraocular pressure maintain at around 25 30 or even a little bit less than that while surge handling designs most important is identifying vitreous crisis as you see this video define epicenters before cutting and when you see the epicenter just gently open blade and go on either side blade will be on either one i blade either side or that's epicenter and once you're either side gently again lift the epicenter so that retina get marginally stretched and when you cut that epicenter retina falls back so that way you minimize the risk of creating break don't pull up straight because it's direct entry posterior pull or tuck can again tear the retina so your movement should be gently along the plane of the retina a uh, little bit uh, just gentle up gentle uh, lifting it to just identify epicenter and cut those up as you keep on cutting you change your grip you keep on rolling the membrane lifting gently and cutting and then once a reasonable amount is separated you can use a cutter to cut that membrane off extra membrane loose membrane and then continue dissection further but if unfortunately your break is you created a break then again, don't ignore it. As soon as you see the break, you cauterize so that uh, that acts as a basically more suppose bleeder is there at the edge of the break that will be that will help to stop the bleeding. Not only that, this is help you to mark the break because when you do fluid action lateral, sometimes you will miss that break otherwise, or sometimes you have blood clot rolling over it, and at the time of uh, uh, reattaching retina with a fluid erection, you may miss that break and you may not be able to identify. <laughs> so once you create the break. And you continue dissection in the same plane. Sometimes, what happens? The tug or traction created on break can keep on a break and keep on getting enlarged. So you need to change your plan. Now you start dissecting at another location, and now dissection should be towards the break, not away from the break, so that <clears throat> break does not enlarge. But if also retina start becoming mobile as uh, because of break and as uh, fluid starts seeping through, bimanual surgery would be a better option in this scenario. But once you have created a break, you have to ensure that you relieve now entire traction and if necessary, uh, additional steps like uh, supporting with a buckle or retinectomy or retinotomy, you can need to add on. And so where those additional steps are, as I said, if you create a break or traction is unrelieved, same thing I repeating again, you can have scleral buckling or retinotomy if necessary. Peripheral, sometimes peripheral um, breaks again, you will have to after doing fluid direction, you need to laser for those breaks and all these eyes will need internal tamponade. Now here is typical case we had peripheral traction was unrelieved and these eyes if we leave like that either later on they come back with the RD or this traction can cause recurrent episodes of bleeding in these eyes. Now to relieve this traction sometime because it's peripheral and this is a young patient lens was clear peripheral retina is thin. So higher risk of hydrogenic complication if you try to dissect this membrane out or you may have to you may end up touching the lens or removing the lens so to avoid both the things what i did is rather than removing entire membrane and creating a break and because posterior pole was quite nicely attached so i just suggest, suggest put a segmental buckle here to take care of that traction and left it as it is patient is holding on extremely well quite a long time now more than 10 15 years holding on now, occasionally what happens is membranes are firmly adherent and over underlying little bit blood clot combination is become a one single thick layer of retina and membrane. And uh, typically, again, you see this when you have associated occlusion of one of the vessels. 
and that situation this is almost impossible to separate those membranes from the retina and you will end up removing mem membrane and the retina all together particularly once you have created a break because unless you remove that entire thing traction will not be relieved okay so here retinectomy removing everything and then setting like a regmatogenous detachment and generally it works well coming to the fluorid extensive proliferation generally what you need to do is we use our anti -vagups. the purpose of anti is to reduce the vascularity for proliferation during your vitrectomy so that it helps to reduce the intra bleeding now how it exactly works still we are having a lot of debate but what we all experience that once we have anti up in eye surgery technically become definitely easier prolif separates much easier we have less intraoperative bleeding so less diathermy so reduce post operative inflammation as well now because there is less bleeding so better intraoperative visualization so it definitely surgery become much faster few instrument exchanges so surgery time again that helps reduce and also sclerotomy related hydrogenic complications all reduce and more complete removal of the fibrous proliferation, so reduce the risk of recurrent post-operative him, and overall that way helps to better functional and anatomical outcome. And these are two eyes, uh, basically young uh, patient, both eyes. I'm showing the post anti vagus broad proliferation. This is type one diabetes, and see like most of the proliferation have become almost a vascular during dissection, and I could easily this was like a 10,000 uh, k with a bevel tip. So could uh, separate easily. This is again showing typically using cutter as a uh, scissor and also cutting across here as directly delamination and segmentation, two separate techniques here using the same cutter. And this is a post-op picture. I could manage this uh, those probably without creating hydrogenic complications and extremely gratifying results in this patient holding on almost more than four years now. This is another case. You see the proliferation post avastin is totally dried out, and this is post-operative picture at six weeks. This is the same patient, other eye having avastin injection, and then post avastin this area become almost avascular. And when you look at six weeks, those silicon oil we have to inject, holding on very well. So basically, when what is interval? What should be interval between injection and vitrectomy? So when you look at a, uh, how things work, when you inject anti wage up there's a rapid regression okay but once with the time passes this uh, there's a difference between now this uh, uh, balance tilts between the growth factor and tip towards the fibrosis so what happened as time passes fibrous component takes over and cause contraction of this um, membranes leading to worsening of the tractional detachment and also reactivation of the uh, like a reproliferation as well so typically it can happen any time after two weeks, though we assume that uh, uh, generally effect lasts around four weeks, four to six weeks, but generally it can happen any time after two weeks. So probably surgical, best surgical window would be, I would say, would say three to 10 days before you are, maybe after your injections. So to, uh, to, we don't want to miss that window. So ensure that get a systemic clearance before your injection. But if by chance surgery get delayed, please do not use the repeat injection before surgery. This is one of the case, proliferation in pre and post avastin, you see whole thing got fibrous, but subsequently patient had other systemic issues. Surgery got delayed almost one and a half month. And when I took him for surgery, and this is what massive bleeding, I, it was almost extremely difficult, impossible for me. I had to stop halfway through. I could not complete this surgery. So we uh, just stopped the surgery halfway through because, and then, re-injected and took him again for after two to three weeks and this was uh, this was the only eye patient had and ultimately re-injection and surgery he is doing well now now you do really do not need to inject anti vagus in every case the probably definite benefit when you expect in the cases where you have severe pdr very florid polyp or partial or no pvd uh, iris angle neovascularization or nvg we dealing with or anti halide proliferation these are the probably i would definitely go ahead with anti vagus but these are a little bit uh, probable benefits situation where you have well laser eye, um, PVD induced vitreous hemorrhage, uh, and incomplete PVD, or you have a non clearing vitreous hemorrhage. Sometimes you would like to use this one. But cases where you have already fibrosis, extensive fibrosis, burnt out retinopathy, or 
PRUCP macular fibrosis and are having a macular VMT, these are the eyes probably not a good idea to use. In fact, sometimes it is risky and things can worsen. TRD can convert into CRD if you use anti VEGF in these eyes. So ultimately, basically, it's a surgeon's discretion. So his competence and experience will uh, make a final judgment whether to use anti VEGF or not. I'm not going to just conclude here. So just so TRD and CRD, they are the commonest indications for vitrectomy in PDR. Extramacular TRD can safely be observed. All the various techniques are described. Generally, the selection, selected one is a combination of all the techniques. MIVS usually allows vitrector to be used as cutter, as forceps, as scissors, or as a pick, reducing the need for ancillary instruments and making surgery safer and less time consuming. Bionomalian surgery facilitates more aggressive membrane dissections and more difficult cases can be are amenable to surgery. Pre-op use of anti vegab may help to minimize the intra-op complications and to achieve more complete membrane removal, leading to overall better anatomical success. However, final visual outcome depends on a macular status. Just to show this case where he had a macular, lot of exudated submacular exudate or interactional exudates, eventually, though everything goes well, this also looks okay, but visual outcome was not that great. So just uh, take this opportunity to block you people and invite you. We are having a coming up retina summit on 30th June and 1st of July, 2023. And this time uh, topic will be, theme will be macular surgery. So thank you very much for patient hearing. And I'm stop sharing here, forum is open. Back to... Excellent talk, sir. It was really nice to go through the talk. And I will quickly introduce everyone here, the, you and the other panelists, and then we'll go for the questions. So everyone knows uh, Dr. Pramod Bende, sir. We had a really nice class just now. He is a senior consultant and director at Sri Bhagwan Mahavir Veteran Services Medical Research Foundation, Sankar Nitrale. He did his MS Ophthalmology in, in 1990 from Nagpur GMC, then Retina Fellowship at Sankar Nitrale in 1991 to 1993. Then he has been consulted and VR department Sankar Nitrale since then. Currently, Director of VR Services at Sankar Nitrale. His special interest is in ROP, combined anterior and posterior segment surgeries, and diabetic retinopathy. So, our first panelist uh, is Dr. Amit S. Nene. Uh, he is a gold medalist and associated with ISA Nitrale as uveitis and vitro retina surgeon. He has completed comprehensive and subspecialty retina fellowship at prestigious LB Prasad I Institute. He is a member of Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, DNB, and F he also has a FICO degree. His interest is in uveitis, ROP, diabetic retinopathy, and he is a member of various ophthalmic society and keen interest in academic and research. I would like to have your view here, sir. Are you there, Dr. Amit? Yes, I am there. So I just wanted to have some, can you talk something on the class? Uh, yes, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bhende, sir, for such a wonderful presentation. Sir, actually, uh, I have uh, two doubts. Uh, so one is, you had already mentioned your slide, but still I would like a view upon it. Uh, in cases of uh, tractional retinal detachments, if we are able to clear off all the membranes without any breaks, so uh, do you keep the uh, uh, vitreous cavity? Uh, means, do you use any tamponade for it? Do you create a retinotomy to drain off the SRF or you uh, are dependent upon the RP pump just to pump the subretinal fluid out? Uh, basically, I think it's a little bit, uh, I mean, debatable. A lot of people because of, uh, 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 because generally subretinal fluid is thick and viscous. Quite a few surgeons, they prefer to create a retinotomy and drain subretinal fluid out. I personally don't do that. Because see, you already retinize detach since quite a long time. And you do not want to add on hydrogenic uh, component, I mean, rather uh, ring component to that. 
And generally, as we see, fun fun final functional outcome does not change whether you drain, creating a break, adding tamponade, whether oil, gas, subsequent positioning, all those things, and most of the systemic issues. So they're difficult to maintain positioning. And when your functional outcome is same, you single simple surgery, we make complicated, particularly if you guys again, lens changes later on. So I would personally, I won't do that. If there is no break, no air, no gas, no tamponade. Leave it as it is. Invariably, retina settles down on its own over a period of time. Okay, so and uh, what is your view on combined surgeries? Means uh, combining cataract surgeries along with vitreotomies. So do yeah, you prefer? I, yeah, because of time uh, issue, I did not add that. But again, uh, if lens is clear, I won't go for a cataract surgery as a primary, along with as like all the cases should be done combined cataract and vitreotomy. But if lens is hazy, patient is having a cataract, then definitely I combine both together, but not with a clear lens. Where I can manage vitrectomy without, a, uh, as long as my visualization is not compromised, I won't remove the cataract. But I don't hesitate. I myself do both combined surgeries now. So wherever I have difficulty, uh, we know functional outcome is definitely uh, very good. We previously we used to have issues, but not anymore. We definitely can go ahead with now combined surgery. Thank you, sir. Our next uh, panelist is Dr. Bhavini, uh, who did her, did her veterinary training from Agrawal Sai Hospital, Chennai. She also has a 5CO degree and then she worked as a retina consultant and IQ super specialty uh, hospital, Surat, for five years. She is currently practicing as veterinary retina surgeon in Center for Sight, Surat, and has experience of more than eight years in the field of VR. She has publication in numerous peer-reviewed journals, multiple presentations in national conference. Ma'am, uh, I would like to have your words for the talk. Yeah, thank you for the lovely introduction. And I would like to thank Patul sir and ASG Hospital for giving this opportunity. PB sir, it was a wonderful hearing you. You are always excellent. So uh, I just want to uh, make out a few points from the sir's presentation. That in diabetic vitrectomy, to get a correct plane for the dissection is very important. Do the surgery in lower IOP so that you can see even a minor bleeders and cauterize it immediately immediately so that the chances of combined detachment would be less. I just would uh, like to ask Pramod sir that uh, do you use sir visco for membrane dissection? What is your view in that sir? It can be used uh, so but sometime uh, what happened dissection like uh, most of the cases we can manage but yes now with the time we all know visco can be used uh, previously the but difficulty is difficult to judge the force with which you inject the visco. Right, sir. Uh, yes, uh, people have uh, talked about having a visco field in a cannula and connect it with the direct uh, your machine, like a, a silicon oil injection. Similarly, you can have a syringe filled with a visco, have a very minimal uh, pressure uh, so that it will have a continuous gentle flow and that will help to delineate or open up uh, space between the membrane and the retina. It can be done, but cannula specific cannula selection may not be available with everybody. And sometimes pushing the cannula between the retina and the, uh, this one, the membrane, uh, sometimes it can be tricky. But yes, uh, advantage now because of again MIVS. Previously, you, you with the 20 gauge, you used to have a large cleavage you, you had to create, and that time, a lot of time, there was to be a risk of hydrogenic tears. And that's why people have given up. But now again, we are revisiting because uh, now you don't need that big cleavage because of you now your narrow and smaller gauge instruments are there. So yes, it can be done. Uh, personally, I not doing as a routine. Okay, sir. And I think there is one question in chat box also, and even I wanted to ask that that in which cases of diabetic vitrectomy do you like to peel the ILM, sir? In all cases, you do. Most of the time, no. Particularly, only if you have see the this uh, as a, if there is no macular role, no question of peeling ILM at all. That is one thing. Even if it's uh, uh, 
uh, ILM, even if there's a macular hole, these holes are mainly we know is attractional hole. Mechanism is different here than what you deal with uh, your uh, like a idiopathic macular hole. So if I feel comfortable that I have relieved all the traction, quite sometimes this hole, they close on its own. Very rarely this type of case, if I feel the hole is larger enough or I feel traction I'm not happy with, probably I will try and feel ILM in those eyes. But as a routine, I know people, they do. Uh, of course, few people are comfortable with, but as a routine, I do not feel ILM in diabetic cases as a routine. We need to understand every step in a surgery has its own set of complication. So that this is added step, so added risk of complication, which we can easily avoid. And spongy macula or mobile retinite posterior pole is not that easy to peel ILM as you spill in your uh, idiopathic macular hole. But I personally feel it's not necessary, but yes, uh, there are people, they are doing it. So it, it can be, I mean, I leave the surgeon's discretion, I would say. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful answers. And we are really satisfied and learning a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you, sir. Our next panelist is Dr. Devasis Dube. He is consultant uh, Vito Retina UVI and ROP services at ASGI Hospital. He has done his MBBS and MD from Ames, Delhi. F, uh, Rita Fellowship from Sankara Eye Hospital, Bangalore, and then short term medical retina and UVI from SNC Chitrakoot. He was ex consultant of the Department of Vitro Retina in Sankara Eye Hospital, over 30 research publications, and review. he is also a reviewer for Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and American Journal of Ophthalmology case reports. Dr. Devasis, are you here? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Kartike, for that introduction. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to just say it, it was a fabulous talk by PB Sir, and it was uh, an honor to be listening to it. Uh, he's almost covered all the points that are there, but uh, just for the sake of the fellows and the young surgeons who've joined in, I would like to elaborate a couple of more points there. So uh, first of all, as Sir was also mentioning that uh, preoperative ultrasound is very important, especially checking the area where PVD has taken place because uh, initially the first step during a diabetic vitrectomy that, would be, that we would want to do is uh, identify that area and create an opening over there. And uh, once the opening has been created there, then using that opening, we should go uh, quadrant wise separating the uh, uh, vitreous. So we, we usually don't induce a PVD like we induce in a macular hole. So here we have to go very slowly and uh, usually go quadrant wise so that we don't end up uh, creating hydrogenic breaks. And uh, another point onto this is, uh, Subhyoid hemorrhage is actually a friend in such cases because subhyoid hemorrhage is able to show us that th these are the areas where the PVD has already taken place. So if the height of the subhyoid hemorrhage is good enough, then we can actually directly go in with a cutter, create an opening there, and again use that to uh, induce the PVD properly. If it is a very shallow subhyoid hemorrhage, then uh, I would recommend using a pick or a 24 gauge needle in order to just uh, create an opening there. Secondly, as Sir was also mentioning about uh, uh, shysis uh, in order to see the correct plane, vitro shysis. So some surgeons also call it as the second membrane. So just for the uh, fellows, it's important to understand the anatomy that has taken place over there in order to find the proper plane. So uh, in this, uh, the posterior cortex, so the posterior cortex phase of the vitreous which is adherent to the retina. So what happens is that neovascular tissue starts growing inside that. And once it starts leaking, the posterior cortex phase, it kind of separates into two parts, the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. This is because of the leakage that has taken place in between. And the fibrous tissue or the membranes that form that they usually form in between these two. And the posterior leaflet is attached to the retina. The membranes are just above the posterior leaflet. And then the anterior leaflet is covering the membranes and it is also attached to the retina at some plane. So if we don't go to the correct plane and start pulling directly, it will lead to a lot of hydrogenic breaks and the bleeding that usually takes place is very difficult to control. And uh, just the another point was, uh, as Sir was showing in his uh, uh, presentation, while he was uh, removing the membranes uh, in a CRD case, the retina was slightly lifting up. So uh, in Sir's experience, hands it's it's okay to be uh, like, like it's okay to be doing like that. But 
for young uh, budding surgeons, I would definitely uh, recommend going and switching ahead, doing a bimanual surgery, because it is uh, much more easier for us to control uh, if the retina is also pulling up with that. It is, it is and, bimanual, uh, uh, Devashish. Because I only thing is I was using light pile to hold the retina back, and <laughs> you are absolutely right. It is bimanual. Yes. Okay. And uh, thank you, Dr. Just one uh, last additional point is. Um, if there is a, a CRD case and there, uh, so one mistake that we usually do, or I, I also used to do earlier was if I am able to see the break of the CRD and directly go in and uh, remove of the subretinal fluid. So I would advise to keep the subretinal fluid as it is a thick fluid and it helps the retina to be less mobile. So you're able to control the removal of membranes much better. Uh, because if we do a fluid fluid exchange and the subretinal fluid gets uh, like the, the infusion fluid takes its place, then the retina becomes much more mobile. So it's better to keep the uh, subretinal fluid inside, remove all the membranes, and then later on go in with a fluid fluid exchange. And I'll I'll also have one question for uh, PB sir. Sir, uh, in case we uh, we plan to put a buckle or or a belt later on during the surgery, we plan to do that. Preferably, uh, would you want to do it under saline uh, or is it okay to be doing it under uh, uh, air or gas? Yeah, it is uh, particularly buccal. You want to put in a detached retina, particularly uh, where you have a regmatinous component. I would say I would uh, complete everything, settle the retina, do a laser, everything. And then you, I would, of course, keep air inside. Now, to make I more firm because you need a, some counter traction again to pass your sutures. So what I would uh, raise the temp uh, intraocular pressure probably up to 35. Plug the sclerotomies. If necessary, you can take a like a, a suture also across and have a slip knot. So now eyeball will be firm for you, uh, and then go ahead with your buckle. Now. If you have open conjunctiva in advance, that's a different ball game. But otherwise, if, if you have to open the conjunctiva for a buckle, then might as well pull out your cap plugs, except probably infusion line, put a uh, temporary suture across, and then open conjunctiva and keeping that pressure around 30, 30, 35. And with that pressure also, clamp the infusion line so that with, when you pull the muscles, that uh, air will not go back and I will again become soft otherwise. So, but you, once it is clamped, you are having a firm eyeball for you to pass your sutures easily that way. Yes. But when you assess the buckle height after passing, after placing the buckle, bring back pressure maybe around 20, 25, because then you, you have a correct assessment. Otherwise, with a 35 pressure, you assess the height, you may see it less. And later on, when pressure comes to normalize, it becomes too high and vice versa. Okay. So that's why what a normal temp, uh, IOP you want at the end or uh, in a normal circumstances, so buccal height should be assessed accordingly. So that's the way you would go. Uh, to add on what you have a nice few uh, nice points, what you elaborated, what I would say ultrasonography, I would prefer operating surgeon should do ultrasonography previous day so that he he knows exactly the pathoanatomy or vitreo retina interface, where it is, which clock hour, what it is, so that your assessment during surgery or your integration and uh, orientation will be far better rather than relying on someone else's ultrasound. Definitely. Sir. Thank you so much. Um, back to you, Dr. Karthik. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Devasi. And there are some questions in the chat box, sir. I'll be reading them out. I think uh, you have them. I will already answer. I think we are already, already answered. answered. So I think role of Karthik. Karthik, one question. Uh, just one minute, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to. Would like to ask one question, sir. Uh, for me also and the other young surgeons also. Uh, suppose you are doing one case, very bad diabetic vitrectomy. Uh, young patient, 30, 35 years, and uh, me, not you. Uh, and I have taken almost two, two and a half, three hours just to clear the disc and the temporal side. And it's still a lot of traction is there on the nasal side. And I am totally mentally fatigued after three hours. Whether should I continue the surgery towards the nasal side or should I leave the nasal side at that time? 
Okay, the first thing is you anticipate this type of cases, pose the case when you are fresh and energetic. Who's up put as a first case in a day, not as a last case in a day. So you are not fatigued. Okay, so your patience level is better. You are not tired. Also, some practical difficulties. Sometimes the last case and you have certain in instrument equipment already unsterile because of other cases. You may not have extra set of equipment instrument. So whatever you need, you have available in theater. Okay. No, these are all practical. We have got practical issues. We have gone through. So definitely put first case, and, and that's why pre-operative assessment is important. So on that day, you put less number of cases, anticipate that this worst case is going to take me three hours or four years. So I'm going, not going to have extra cases uh, and are just enough which I can manage. That's the most important because I, back of mind, when you think that I have so many cases to go, that also your patient's level goes down and then you land up in a problem. Now, coming back to your issue, uh, give an option once I'm inside, I would like to finish the surgery, one thing. Finish, try to clear all the membranes as far as possible. Now, small island of membrane somewhere is left, and you think removing that membrane, not because of fatigue, but suppose I clean everything in small area where I feel there's a high risk of creating hydrogenic problem, which is on nasal side, probably, or even far away periphery in a temporal side, macula is clear, no transmitted traction, no actual traction, so totally free of uh, uh, any traction. But if I mean, leaving that area, I'm not going to compromise functional outcome or anatomical outcome. But if you try to remove that, and if I create a hydrogenic break, then definitely, in fact, I'm going to compromise everything here. So that assessment you have to make before taking on a, before stopping. And if something you feel, yes, proceeding further is detrimental to the eye, probably I would say stop, okay? Keep eye on everything, not just because of fatigue, but because of, your fatigue also make you more prone to create more hydrogenic problems. Okay, so that assessment, I think surgeon to surgeon has to do on table. Okay, but yes, uh, which is a lesser evil, you have to look into it when you deal that way. Even I am not again spoken to, sometimes what happens, you leave a large clot behind. And uh, uh, like uh, you're just not able to remove everything. I mean, not able to remove that clot. You try to remove, start, try to remove, start bleeding. Now, if you're sure that you have removed all the membranes, but only clot is left now. And now quite some time it after removing this clot can lead to hydrogenic problem, then things become messy. So that situation, I would say, leave that clot behind. Inform patient, counsel them later on, and take him after maybe around any time, three weeks, four weeks, so that all this blood is now liquefied. Things become simple. Either blood will get absorbed on its own, or you can just go ahead, do lavage, and do laser, whatever left or area. Things become much, much simpler, easier, without having any complication. Coming back to your part again, nasal membranes you have left, you said. But a situation where you have already created a break somewhere else. Now you are not dealing with a fractional RD, but you are doing with regmatinous component. The moment that regma is added, you have to remove all the traction. There is no compromise. No, you don't have choice. You have to remove all the traction. Otherwise, he is going to come back. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, yeah. thank you, sir. Karthik, continue. Thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful presentation. Uh... Uh, on diabetic vitrectomy, uh, there are a few more questions in the chat box. One is ki, uh, if there is a disc bleed, uh, which you did cover, ki how to manage those, but sometimes it becomes a really big trouble uh, controlling a bleed at the disc. And it, it is uh, what, what you uh, would suggest the fellows, young fellows to uh, avoid it. One second is uh, uh, even if starts, how to manage those. Uh, basically, if you remove the prolif completely over the disc, surprisingly, it does not bleed that way that much. Eventually, sometimes it stops on its own, quite some time. But yes, some stump is left here and there, some filaments are, is there, and then it's not allowing vessel to retract back and then they bleed. Now, I first thing I would suggest stop your surgery. Don't come out of 
to die. But if now with a plug, plug like you are having a sclerotomy with trocar with having a, a plug, so sometimes you can just uh, wall cannulas, particularly when you're dealing with. So basically what you want to, you don't want to have a turbulence in a vitreous cavity, free flowing uh, fluid takes blood away, not allowing it to clot. So stop your cuttings, stop your suction, and stay there in that eye for some time. Raise the bottle height. It stops sometime. Okay. Very rarely, gently I touch my cutter over the disc, allow a little bit blood to uh, come up. And as this start clotting, gently hold your cutter over that clot. So sort of mechanically supporting it, hold it for a while. And that most of the time again works. Very rarely, you may have to increase pressure almost up to 60, 70, very rarely. But then that situation, again, look at a blood pressure. So you don't want to have high uh, pre intraocular pressure for a long period of time. But if you may be 30 seconds or maybe one minute or so, if you hold on, probably again, it helps to stop. And fluid air exchange, you can do again, because air, again, the advantage is it, you can increase the pressure, but at the same time, air will keep entire blood at one place. So that giving time for everything together to clot. Okay, so, but disadvantage is once you start removing the air, some of that clot, if it's a little bit larger enough, it stuck to the retina nicely, and probably you may have to leave it behind to try to just uh, remove that off, sometimes create a hydrogenic problem, which is spread uh, around the in a peri papillary area. Okay, so, uh, and when you, once your bleeding stops, when you try to re remove the clot, trim all around, but that clot right on the disc, probably you leave it, allow it to dissolve over a period of time, tell patient that next few days vision will be easy, you are not going to see immediately everything, not going to be okay next day, but assure him that just matter of time, this blood is clear over a period of few weeks and you'll be okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, just uh, one more uh, to add, uh, what is your ideal time of giving anti-VEGF uh, to your patient, sir? Uh, whether it is three days, one day prior or a week prior? No, I told you, like I just said, the ideal window will be somewhere between three to 10 days. That's the window. That's what my slide was showing. But yes, what happened? Most of us having our schedule, surgery schedule, uh, certain fixed days, few of, quite a few of us don't operate every day. So you look at literature, you say within 24 hours, uh, you see the effect. But I would wait for, for at least a couple of days more. So somewhere between what we, our system and OT schedule falls off, so anything between surgery generally happen between third and fifth day, most of the time, post the anti -vagia. Thank you, sir. Uh, if I can add one more point. So regarding the disc bleed, so I have started using a PFCL to stop the disc bleed in such cases. So, sir, have you any experience with that? Uh, actually, theoretically, it has been described, but pre-FCL most of the time doesn't help to stop bleeding because it doesn't give that much of surface tension or tamponading effect because you are not going to feel entire eye with the PFCL. A small bubble of PFCL over it generally doesn't give, I would say, air pressure, air is better than having a better surface tension than PFCL. It generally doesn't help that much. You can use if you have, it's an expensive option, but uh, still air probably I would feel much more effective than PFC. Okay, sir. And sometimes it mix with the clot, multiple bubble and all those things, removal becomes sometimes then difficult and chances of retaining, leaving the uh, couple of bubble, PFC bubble behind is kind of, that is a kind of obvious possibility. Okay. So just one more question, sir. Uh, do you uh, give uh, intraoperative NTVEGF at the end of the surgery? Uh, again, it's it's a, cases? yeah, it, as a routine, I do not give. Uh, but yeah, there are a couple, uh, few articles supporting to that, few articles against that also. Uh, yes, uh, because when you do laser at the end of surgery, as we know, all of us, laser takes few weeks, or I would say around two to three months to have its effect. So that after that you have which of secretion will be less. And during that window, suppose theoretically speaking, during that window, if you give anti probably it will help to hold on, take care of your 
because uh, whatever wage of secretion will be minimized and then later on laser take up. So that way, logically, you can explain. But also what we need to understand when you give an anti wage of anti wage of you prevents healing. Anti wage of prevents the blood vessel which is going to retract and clot sometime and close the lumen. Anti wage of prevent that one also. So sometimes thereout when you look back again, sometimes even post. So if anti wage even there's a higher risk of rebleeding in early post operative period. Oh. I mean, articles are there supporting both ways. So, but as a routine, if we have a clean dissection done, adequate laser done, I, I, I don't inject at the end of surgery. Maybe exceptional situation propose you have a, um, like a, a neovascular glaucoma, iris or angle neovascularization, but those are the cases generally you are already given anti vagab before surgery, most of the time. Right, sir. Thank you. So, uh, one more question for on, on relating to this topic only. Sir, uh, giving an anti VEGF and not doing surgery in that stipulated time window can actually lead to devastating uh, problems later on. And also, especially in patients who've had recent episodes of cardiovascular problems, like say within three months, uh, it might not be recommended to give anti VEGF prior to surgery. So, uh, recently I stumbled upon an article which said that even with the yeah, Ozodex implants, there is some amount of regression of neovascular tissue in the eye. Uh, this is uh, this was published sometime in 2016-17. So uh, I would I want to ask your opinions or uh, whether this would be a good alternative, giving an Ozodex implant look to see for the uh, regression before going for a uh, surgery in, in such scenarios wherein there might be a possibility that the patient is not uh, physically fit in order to then there is a possibility that the surgery might be delayed now steroids when you talk about steroids have anti-inflammatory activity steroid also have anti-fibrotic activity and steroids have mild anti anti of like activity okay so definitely steroid has there some role but then again, it's an expensive option. It's not really that much effective. And if you at all you want to use, probably why not to try even just give a tricot because anyway, within a few days, you are going to take him for surgery. Glaucoma issue is not that much, which is the cheapest option. If at all I had to use, probably I would use a tricot. Only thing is again, adding tricot, oh, the issue will be, uh, media will be a little bit uh, uh, like a hazy for a while. But anyway, to induce PVD, we all use tricot, right? Yes. Sir. May, maybe give a few days earlier and then take a take a case rather than having a you know, ozodex implant. I mean, you can have a, yes for a study sake. Definitely, if you are giving you drug free of cost, but such a expensive implant just for a sake of regress and then taking for surgery probably uh, may not be practical approach for all of us. True. Sir. Rather, most of us, I would say. So IVT might be a good suitable uh, alternate to that. Uh, in case, in case, but I know I don't know whether how effective really personal also, experience not having much. We tried giving previously, particularly ROP. Probably we used to have early studies when you show we try to give a tricot, even pre-surgery, post-surgery, like what we are talking about now, anti vegf post-surgery, but really did not make much difference because activity is so mild, uh, not really very effective for your surgery as such to regress the proliferation. Yes, Thank you. All right, sir. I think most of the questions have been answered. There's one more question where Dr. Falcon is asking vitrectomy in asteroid hyalysis cases, how it is different from routine diabetic vitrectomy? Uh, well, uh, yes, indications wise is probably only indication is definitely is uh, there's no view of the retina to do laser. That's the most important thing. Sometimes you can manage to if uh, asteroids are not that uh, significant, but the indication would be like media opacity. The most important thing here is majority of cases, I won't say all, majority of cases in a, with asteroid, they do not have PVD. So inducing PVD can be very, very traumatic in this eyes. You have to anticipate, you have to take for granted that uh, there is not going to be PVD and I'm going to have a difficult time. So if you are, you are having a PVD, probably you are lucky. 
ultrasonography to some extent help, but typical ultrasonography of the of asteroid uh, eyes, you know, there will be clear zone between retina and vitreous. So probably it can be misleading and you may not be judged whether really PVD is there or not. So, but yes, most of the cases there's no PVD and induction of PVD is, is extremely difficult. So you have to be very careful and go gingerly, very slowly, step by step, but still probably you may land up in few hydrogenic bricks. All right, sir. Thank you for the answers. And uh, other questions uh, are, is it always necessary to remove all membranes from the disc or can we trim and leave a small FAP? I think this has also been answered. Yeah, but basically if you want to leave sometime, but there's a th theoretical possibility of reproliferation if you leave behind. So basically as a VR surgeon, if I'm going inside, I want to remove everything. Everything, yes. Give an option. But small stuff, if you're really worried about, you can leave it. Uh, but ensure that uh, right on the disc, stump is there to minimize the risk of bleeding. Don't cauterize on that right over the disc because you can have a significant thermal damage to them. Right. Once macula is involved, till what time we can get useful vision after vitrectomy? Is our fellow Dr. Vajinder is asking. See, you eventually you need to take as early as possible once macula is involved. Earlier the better, but as the egmatinous component of RD, we know up to a week. Previously, we used to take as a very early, but even up to a week or so now, though, now we know uh, that uh, functional outcome does not get compromised that significantly. But most of the time, by the time macula is involved in diabetic eyes, the surrounding retina, which is pulled up, already is thinned out, atrophic. So, but still, yes. I, I won't say exact in days because there are a lot of other systemic issue environment. You have to get a clearance and all those things. So early as possible, probably I would say, I won't say emergency that same day or next day morning, but earlier the better, if at all, I mean, longer remaining detached, again, you are compromising the function allowed. I think this, uh, he wanted to ask how, if the bankula is involved till what time we can get useful vision after vitrectomy. So he wanted to know uh, like, no, your still vision is always if we can detach macula, you reattach. Definitely, vision improvement will be there. But mm -hmm. then, as I said, whether macula is cystic, atrophic, uh, ischemic, uh, optic disc is how bad it is. So overall, final vision depends on that. But yes, uh, I would say vision improvement definitely will be there when you reattach macula back. Right from the next day itself. Yeah. Uh, no, it takes obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it can take a few, few days, weeks, your tamponade or other things to settle down. So, okay. It's not weird. And unfortunately, we are doing VR surgery, not cataract surgery. That today you operate and tomorrow you are having a 6.5 or 6.4. No. Yeah. We, we, are, we have to be patient. Some, uh, some, uh, some benefit may, will be there once the macula is attached from exactly. the next. Exactly. Some benefit will be there. We can put it. Yes. But there are situations, everything is attached and you have like a, all the vessels are sclerosed and disc is atrophic and region is hand movement still or PLPR. So right, that's sir. the accept as a, because there are a lot of other factors involved. Right, sir. So the next question you have already answered in which in the cases of diabetic vitrectomy do you peel ILM? So this was answered. Certain, uh, the Dr. Hertz was in asked certain books say we should keep the infusion pressure high throughout the surgery. Uh, I think most of us do not want to do because we know this uh, disc and macula is already compromised in this eyes. Okay, mm -hmm. so and with the MIVS, wall cannulas, uh, so we, once we are in, because fluctuations are much more uh, detrimental than actually uh, having a uniform pressure. So most of us are compatible working with 20, 25, uh, maximum up to 30, where you have a bleeder. So temporarily, I would say increase the pressure and bring back to around that 25 or uh, level as early as possible. Because definitely with a high pressure, you are bound to have a compromising disc circulation further and as we have enough uh, reports and all of us are always wonder, in spite of surgery going everything fine, table on table, this was okay, but you will end up having failed disc later on and vision is poor. Probably that is the reason. So I, I won't recommend having a maintaining high pressure throughout surgery. Definitely not. 
sir right. what is your take sir what is your take on uh, low iop vitrectomy in diabetic like the pressure is around 15 to 18 you see i mean it's uh, see again uh, this uh, debatable things but just see, it, it can be as long as globe doesn't collapse during your vitrectomy so if you are reducing the iop probably you are, you have to flow also you have to reduce otherwise with that low pressure and say you have a suction you are using 300 400 500 uh like uh, suddenly globe collapses and then you have increased the risk of i mean not only bleeding but you are definitely compromising situation so it's always a balance between but yes definitely i do not use high pressure somewhere around 20 25 all of us feel 25 all of us feel comfortable low pressure certain cases probably you feel already glaucomatous cupping or uh, compromise the circulation in a diabetic due to diabetic itself you are dealing with ischemic eye probably yes little bit lower but not that low that uh, during vitrectomy you activate suction and globe collapses okay sir i think other questions are mostly answered so if any more questions then we can wait or we can wrap it up dr ganesh uh it it has been a wonderful session sir uh, you have uh, described each and everything in such a detailed manner i think uh, every fellow has benefited out of this and uh, we had a very good audience more than 85 people joined in uh, for this uh, uh, session of dr pramod bende sir uh, i would also like to uh, thank our panelists uh, uh, who have given their precious time uh, for teaching uh, and the fellows over here Dr. Atul sir, uh, Dr. Atul yeah, I, yeah, 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 Ganesh. It, it, really, it was a wonderful session, and so many videos, so many tips of the life, and everything was there. Everything, whatsoever you want to know about the diabetic vitrectomy, you, you can, you, you have learned today. I, I am amazed that the the quality of the videos and the, everything about the diabetic vitrectomy. thank you very much sir and thank you thank you very much for having me here once again thank you all okay. and yes have a wonderful week ahead thank you sir thank you so much sir we stop now yes sir thank you sir thank you thank you so much sir yeah sir thank you so much nice to have everyone looking forward to more such session from you sir thank you so much bye thank you bye bye, bye. take care yeah thank you bye thank you